communication plan, the required project for level three of the visionary communication path, is based on the stunningly obvious theory that we tend to get better results when we plan what we want to do before we try it. That's certainly true in public speaking and nowhere more true than in contest speaking. This evening, Lloyd Smith will describe the planning process that preceded his entry in the International Speech Contest in spring 2013. Anyone who expects to advance in that contest to the district level and beyond needs a plan that takes into account the special circumstance of the speaking situation and his or her strengths and weaknesses as a speechwriter and speaker. While non-contest speaking doesn't require such careful planning, it still requires attention to these two things, Lloyd Smith and the plan. Thank you, Lloyd. I do the Toastmasters speech contests because they're fun and they're challenging. Lots of people don't like that thought of contest speaking, but it's a quirk in my personality that I do. Now, the humorous speech contest is nothing but fun, and I find it extremely easy to do. I've won the district contest four times in that and finished second another time. The international speech contest, however, is a very different animal. That is not fun at all for me, and it's very, very difficult. I spend a lot of time and effort on my speeches, but it definitely is challenging. The problem that I have with the International Speech Contest is that it's not at all a good fit for my skill set, which requires me to adjust the skill set and sometimes the speech, and that's actually what I'm going to be talking about tonight. The International Speech Contest requires a serious speech, usually inspirational in nature. What the rule book does not say is that all successful international speeches, all winning speeches, follow a strict formula. An event happened. I somehow overcame the bad aspects of that event. I learned a lesson from it, and the lesson applies to the audience. If you don't follow that formula, everybody will clap, but you're not going to get a trophy. Now, the problem is, it's a fact. <laughs> The problem is, in the real world, and this is nowhere in the, in the rule book, a lot of the speeches turn out to be what I call misery memoirs. You know, they're tragic accounts of horrible events, people surviving cancer, people having their, their families get injured in house fires. You know, they, they tend to be, uh, you know, my brother died, my dreams died, I almost died, I should have died. <laughs> <laughs> or he gave the speech, I would hope, but in any event. It's, I can't do that kind of speech. I detest that misery memoir speech. So about four or five months before the 2013 contest, I decided I was going to talk about the suicide of a student that occurred on uh, December 31st, 1995. Now that presented a challenge. It would be very easy to do a misery memoir about that topic, but I didn't want to do that. So I mulled it over, and I thought, first of all, I had to think about my audience. That's the first part of any kind of a communication plan. Now, in this case, I, I designed my speeches from the start to be what I call big room speeches. What I mean is that I intend them to be given in, at the district contest. I just assume I'm going to make it to that level. Talking to a large group is quite different from talking to a small group, and that accounts for what lots of people have noticed, that I seem to be a totally different speaker at those big contests than I am in this room, and that's true. That's partially because I've designed the speech differently. Within that audience, that big group audience, there is a group of judges, seven of them. And I've done enough of the contests that I have a good notion of who the judges are going to be. So when I get up on stage, I, within about 30 seconds, I can usually spot all seven of them. Those people need particular attention during the speech <laughs> for obvious reasons. Once I thought about that, the big room aspects of the speech, I thought, now how am I going to do this? And I realized right away that there was more than one way to approach this. It would have been very easy to just do a narrative, what happened that, uh, leading up to this kid's suicide, and how it affected people afterwards. But that would have been a misery memoir, I didn't want to do that. So I thought, you know, I could, I could do what Aristotle said, and that is try to evoke feelings of pity and fear in the audience, but I could do it without actually talking about the kid committing suicide. As it happened, 
many of you in here heard that speech. Vicki was at the district contest uh, during that. I never actually said the kid committed suicide. In fact, I never said he died. But almost everybody believes that's what I said. What I decided to do was to use tone and mood to establish that. I started with the title of the speech, Blue and Black, which is an inversion of what the, the normal way we say that. And I was contrasting the blue, the door, I call it a doorway to infinity, three times during the speech with the blackness that the kid experienced. And I kept alternating between those two, bringing them closer and closer together until the point was made that, that he was overwhelmed. The, the blue, the doorway to infinity, was overwhelmed by the blackness. Then I thought another thing that I needed to think about was the order of the speech. I didn't want to do a straight narrative, and I got to thinking about Joseph Conrad's novel, Lord Jim, because I was in an online argument with a guy over that. The interesting thing about that book is that it's not told in chronological order, it's told in psychological order. So I decided I would do that too. And that accounts for the structure of the speech, which seems to just zigzag back and forth in time. And it does zigzag back and forth. Uh, if I tried to outline that speech in a, like a Roman numeral type outline, I couldn't do it. It, would, it wouldn't make any sense. But I could draw a physical diagram of it. The core of the speech in the middle is an expository element dealing with teenage suicide, how prevalent it is, and so on. And then around it, there are two spirals. One of them is the narrative of what the kid did, and the other one going in the other direction is the narrative of how it affected everybody. It doesn't sound likely, but if you heard the speech, it tends to hang together and make sense. Finally, I had to think a little bit about how I was going to actually deliver the speech. And it's easy to get weepy. There are people who have done these international speeches. Uh, one internet, the final round of the international speech featured two guys who talked about the death of infant children. Both of them got down on the floor and patted the imaginary. I'm sorry to laugh about that, but it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Patted the imaginary dirt over the kid's grave. And I couldn't see doing that. And so a guy I know in Denver, uh, Rich Hopkins, who's been on the international stage twice, said, why don't you do it in a very uh, straightforward, almost deadpan manner? because that will make the horror of what this kid did and the effect it had seem even more impressive. Uh, it doesn't sound likely, but when I tried it, uh, it worked. So that's what I did. So the point of all of this is not that you're going to do international speech contest, although I encourage you to think about it, but you need to think a little bit about the audience, the purpose of the speech, and your skill set as, as a presenter before you do any kind of speech. But that's especially true in a contest speech. By the way, how did it go? I finished second, which was OK. I thought the woman who did the first place speech did a better speech, although lots of people in the room disagreed with me. That was one of them right there. I happen to know I got three of the seven judges to give me first place ballots, but the other four clearly did not. You know, win some, lose some. So what was it? What was the theme of this woman who won the first place? Also, Peter story, or no? Uh, she was uh, a friend of mine.